would like to thank you for coming. I met Dr. Dolinsky at a Massachusetts Council on Aging conference, and she was speaking as one of the um, people at, that were giving one of the main talks for the conference. And I had been looking for somebody to talk about positive thinking for a number of years, because I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal that said how you could affect your health. So Dr. Dolinsky was going to be booked in a way for a year. Mm -hmm. So I booked her about two years ago. <laughs> so I am thrilled that she was willing to book so far in advance. I can't get most people to book 10 months in advance. And with no further ado, she is a professor at Endicott College. Yep. And we're thrilled to have her. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So I am a professor at Endicott College. It's a medium-sized college up on the North Shore. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. And let's do this. OK, I'm just going to hold it. Um, and I am a social psychologist, which means I'm not a clinician. I am not a therapist. I do not uh, help individuals in a clinical way. I am a researcher, and I'm a professor. And one of my areas that I am quite passionate about is the field of positive psychology. Positive psychology was first developed by a professor by the name of Martin Seligman. He became famous first for a concept called learned helplessness. And if you go on to TED Talk, he has a marvelous TED Talk that introduces how he came into the field of positive psychology through learned helplessness. Realizing that psychology does a great job for certain clinical issues, depression, anxiety, but he thought, you know, psychology needs to do more than just help individuals with clinical issues. We should be trying to help everybody. And he was beginning to look at a concept he developed called learned helplessness. And I don't know if any of you have heard of this. Okay. Um, excellent. Uh, he, began, he was working with a lot of individuals who were depressed. And people saw that as a, a cause for behavior. And he was beginning to realize maybe it's a symptom. And he did a lot of research with dogs where he would put them in a special crate. And in the crate, there would, it would be caged. And there's some ethical issues here uh, that he got approved from Pennsylvania. But the dogs would be put into this crate that would be electrified on the bottom. And it was painful. It was not lethal. And the dogs would obviously try to get out. And they couldn't. They were caged in. And they would keep repeatedly put the dog into the cage. And at first, the dog is trying to get out, trying to get away from this painful electricity. Eventually, the dog, when placed into this cage, would not even try to get out. It would just give up. Right? And the key to this experiment was once the dog stopped trying to get out, he lowered a side of the cage so that all the dog had to do when placed into this special cage was to simply jump to the other side. That's all he had to do, like a five, six inch um, little gate. What he found was the dogs who were trained to be in an unescapable, painful environment, when they were put into this new cage, the dogs didn't try to get out. Right? They had learned to be helpless. The environment had been so uncontrollable for them that even though now the environment had changed, they didn't take the proactive steps. And so this is, he did a lot of research on this learned helplessness. And in a sense, if you can learn to be helpless, then maybe you can be learned to have control over your life. And so he became quite famous for developing this field of positive psychology. And it's not about always being happy. Uh, it's, it's, he has this great uh, analogy. Um, where um, he says, you know, you can, happiness wears out. Right? And he, he has this analogy of, of having ice cream. 
and I just passed an ice cream place coming here. I'm like, oh, that looks really good. Uh, it is, okay. And it's like, oh, I haven't had ice cream. I'm going to have ice cream. But we all know, I mean, that first, that first taste of the ice cream, oh. Second taste, good. But, you know, some, they're getting massive ice creams these days. <laughs> you know, so, you know, by the time you're halfway done, you know, you're just like, eh, you know. <laughs> Happiness sort of runs out, you know. So he actually, you'll see his definition of positive psychology here, using your signature strengths every day to produce authentic happiness and abundant gratification. And the key to this is authentic. And what he basically says, rather than a happy life, he really recommends that you live a meaningful life. Right? Because the happiness will wear out. And there's three dimensions that he emphasizes with a meaningful life. A meaningful life is a connection to others. That you need to have the ability to love, the willingness to love, the courage to love, uh, to be giving, altruistic, to forgive, which is exceedingly hard for many of us, and the spiritual connections. One of the biggest issues for people like us who are getting older is loneliness and social isolation. And it impacts our health. And to have a happy life is to increase these connections with others. Another aspect of a meaningful life are positive individual traits, and you'll see them. A sense of integrity, play, creativity, you know, enjoy one's life, you know, get out of that, that mold that we tend to be in. And then the life regulation qualities regulate your day-to-day -day behavior so you can accomplish your goals. I know a lot of people in my life right, who have a lot of like, I really wish, I really should, I hate that word should, um, you know, but it's like, but they're not changing their day-to-day -day behavior. It's that simple, like, I'm going to make a promise to myself to come to a talk, and I'm going to try to get myself out of the mold. And it's important to have those day-to-day -day activities. Positive psychology is having you practice all of these things. So the first thing that I want to do is I actually have a blue book. Do you see a blue book out here? Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's cl <laughs> classical conditioning here. For those of you who have took psychology classes, we, yes, we still use blue books. All right. I actually want you to take a couple minutes, and I want to have you practice a positive psychology exercise. And one of them is called practicing awe. Right? What's awe? If I ask my if I ask my 18 to 22 year old students what awe is, they would not know. I know you. What's awe? Awe. Huh? Wonder. Wonder. It's that magnificent feeling. That, oh, that's a fabulous word. Magnificent feeling. Right? So I want to take a couple minutes, uh, and I want you to think back to a time when you felt a sense of awe regarding something you witnessed or experienced. Awe has been defined as a response to things that are perceived as vast, overwhelming, and alter the way you understand. This sense of thatness can be physical, a panoramic view from a mountaintop, psychological, a brilliant idea. People may experience awe when they're in the presence of a beautiful natural landscape, a work of art, when they watch a moving speech, a performance witness an act of great altruism, or have a spiritual religious experience. I want you to think of the most recent experience that you've had involving the feeling of awe, and once you identify it, write the experience down. What was it? What were you doing? And more importantly, how did it make you feel? So if you could take two minutes, you're not going to be able to get it all done, but if you could do two minutes, I'm going to ask her for some volunteers to share. Oh, yeah. Ah, yes. Oh, yeah. So be playful and creative. But is there anybody willing to share their awe experience? Yes, sir. Waking up this morning, or more seminal, experiencing the Grand Canyon. Ah, experiencing the Grand Canyon. Wow. And how did that make you feel? A religious experience. A religious experience. And what was happening in your body? Did you notice anything happening in your body? 
your breathing. Hmm? Transferred out. Mm -hmm. Transferred out. And were you suddenly not thinking about the day to day and your daily worries or anything like that? Yes. Anybody else? Yes. I gave away my blue book. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, I came back from traveling all day long, and it was very late at night, raining. And I come to my house, and I'm walking toward the front door, and my helibores were blooming, and uh -huh. three plants, yes. and I just went, wow. Yes. And, and, that, and, and, and suddenly, everything, all that day-to-day -day stuff that you were doing all day, traveling, tired, and suddenly you saw your flowers. Yeah. And I saw your hand. Oh, two, two, two areas, actually. One is walking into St. Peter's Basilica looking at the St. Peter's Basilica. Oh, yes. Especially after it's been cleaned. St. Peter's Basilica, he said. It's awe-inspiring. Yes, it is. It, it stops you in your tracks, but even more so is walking into the Academia in Venice, in uh, Florence, and seeing David. The oh, yes. Right. yes, yes, yes. And you just stop and... You do. Yeah, it, 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 you, marvel. you marvel. You marvel. You marvel. how somebody could, to quote Michelangelo, release from the stone mm. such an impressive, amazing piece of work. And it is extraordinary. And, and I, having been there, I love the ones that are partially done, where you can see like the elbow starting to come out of the stone. It's just and, and unbelievable. The they completed, mm -hmm. the stone would not release them. That's what Michelangelo. Really, I did not know that. That's fascinating. He yes. Could, he could not release it from yes. the stone. So it would uh, Wow. Just for the moment that you do this exercise, I'm willing to bet one, you had to think. And so when you're thinking about this awe inspiring moment, all of the things that might be weighing you down and that you're worried about disappear. Right? And you might have felt a set, your breathing going down a little bit, a little less stress. Right? And that's what these exercises are about. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of research. I'm going to tell you what's the science behind this. Um, share some of my favorite studies, my favorite psychologists. Then I'm going to actually introduce you to some really excellent websites where you can just go right on and practice these kind of exercises. And uh, I actually have a couple of books that I can show you. So the research behind this, one of the, the most interesting studies that was done, um, some individuals found by accident some diaries that nuns had taken from a, a specific con convent. And what they did is they decided to do a qualitative analysis of what the nuns wrote about. And they simply categorized the nuns' writing by positive versus negative. Were there nuns that were spiritual and seeing the best and the good of life? Or where were the nuns that were more dour and unhappy? And they just separated those nuns, and then they simply looked up their death records. And they found that the nuns who wrote in a more positive way across their life lived 10 years uh, more than the nuns who had that more negative approach. Right? Uh, another real interesting uh, study that I like is they looked at professional baseball cards. And they simply looked at the baseball players, whether they were stern or whether they dared to smile on their baseball card. And once again, they looked at how long they lived. And they found that the people who pro chose to present themselves publicly with that smile live longer than those who didn't smile. Right? That I, I, I will constantly check myself when I'm walking around the world, when I'm driving. Right. Well, I'm driving on 128 today, right. and it's like, no, make myself just, if they have found if you just make yourself lift your lips up, <laughs> you will feel happier. You know, the act of it, and I will purposely make myself put a smile on my face, and I will feel better. Um, They've also done a ton of research with students 
A lot of the research is done in Pennsylvania where Seligman is, University of Pennsylvania, um, Stanford, UC Berkeley is huge. And one really interesting study is they had students watch either sad films, joyful films, or uh, fearful films. So obviously the joyful is the positive, the happy. And then they had the students do, um, you know, puzzles that, where you have to think out of the box, abstract, hypothetical thinking. And that they found that the students who watched the happy films could, were much more likely to uh, solve these difficult problems. Uh, so by putting yourself in a happier mood gave you a broader, more global way of looking things. So there's a lot of research that indicates that positive psychology influences our ability to think and our physical health. And in the past 10, 15 years, they've been doing a lot more research with the practice of positive psychology with senior citizens. And you'll see uh, in your handout, it's small, but we have definitely found that individuals who are able to practice a more positive way of life do live longer. Uh, when they are dealing with cardiovascular illness, they are able to recuperate better. Diabetes, they can handle the diabetes better. Common cold, resistance to illness, pain. I just spoke to Dana, uh, who, is, who is a dentist, and saying it was all about the approach he had with his patients. And if I really didn't emphasize the pain, and if I said this is just going to be a little pain, it was, it, they didn't feel it as much. No pain, no pain, no pain right? Um, and cognitive decline, the memory issues that can happen around mid-70s or 80s. Unfortunately, there will be a little bit of a, a, a down for, for memory. And a positive psychology approach has been found to help slow it down or to address it. There's even maybe, you'll see a question mark, the relationship with cancer. Not that it's going to eliminate the cancer, but again, in terms of uh, dealing with the recuperation or, or, or just the progress of the cancer, having a positive psychology approach tends to help. You'll notice, though, I have a caveat. There's a lot of medi mediating variables. This is not like a, you know, positive psychology, you're cured, we're never going to die. Um, it's not going to happen. And some of these are what called really small um, uh, differences. It's like, yes, there's a little bit of improvement, but it's not a huge improvement. For the past um, three years, I've actually been working at um, two senior centers up on the North Shore doing positive psychology training. And so I will offer four-week seminars, and senior citizens will practice these exercises. And my own research has showed that even across a four-week span, they're more optimistic, they have more gratitude, and overall happier and have more meaning in life. So it seems to be um, important to practice positive psychology. Now, why is it working? Now, one of the reasons why they think it works is uh, proposed by a research bar by the name of Barbara Fredrickson. And she believes that the positive psychology practices help to undo the negative physical effects that are happening within your body. And so she did some research where once again, and I love it, it was with students. The worst thing you can do to a student is you can say, you need to give a speech in front of a group of people, <laughs> <laughs> which I did yesterday. Um, and <laughs> I do like to be a sadist once in a while. Um, <laughs> So she told these students, you're going to need to do a speech. In about 20 minutes, you're going to get, get, have to give up and get a speech. And then she says, well, before you give a speech, you need to watch this little film. So once again, they watch either a happy film, a sad film, or a fear film. And they were taking physiological uh, measurements. So the heart rate, the sweating. And they found everybody was you know, really nervous through their, their physical measures. But they found that the individuals who watched the happy film, those stress symptoms went down much faster. They regulated back to normal much more quickly than those who watched a sad or a fearful film. So that it was evidence to show that somehow by 
putting yourself in a happier uh, place, it helped to undo the negative physical effects. The other theory that they're, they're believing that they, um, uh, that might explain this is called the broaden and build theory. And they've certainly found evidence that by being in this positive mood, um, it does open your mind to different solutions. They did some cool research with doctors where they had doctors practice some positive psychology exercises and then gave them case studies. And they found that the doctors who had the positive psychology practice were much more creative and out of the box in diagnosing the cases that they had and coming up with strategies on how to treat their patients. So it seems to open up your mind. And, and you know, a lot of us are like this, you know, it's like this is the way we do things. And it helps to break out that um, closed way of thinking. Another psychologist uh, who, I, this is one of the reasons why I went into the field of, of social psychology, was a man by the name of Albert Bandura. Uh, he was first famous for his work with observational learning and um, the effects of watching aggressive behavior. In the 1960s, he did a very famous study that's um, the shorthand of it is called the Bobo Doll Study, where children would watch an aggressive adult hit. I don't know if you remember Bobo Dolls. They were the inflatable clowns, and it was supposedly good for us our children. I know I had one. To cathart your aggression, you would hit this Bobo Doll. I saw the, I saw the original Bobo Doll at a conference last year. I was so excited. Uh, <laughs> um, but... He, he made his mark with that, basically showing that we learn aggression uh, by watching others. Uh, but he also had a very interesting um, uh, sideline of research on cognitive behavior, the role of your cognitions on your behavior. And specifically, he developed a concept called self-efficacy. Right? In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we as parents and children, we were all about self-esteem. Right? It was just like, we got to make sure our kids feel good about each other. Right? we got to have gold stars and everybody has to have an award. And Seligman was like, you know, I'm not so sure self-esteem is as, is as good as it needs to be. He's like, I'm not sure this is the answer. And instead, he developed a concept called self-efficacy. And you can probably tell by some of the images that I have here. Self-efficacy is the belief that you can do something. He felt that this was incredibly important for motivation to get somebody to get out and accomplish something. You have to have a belief that you can actually accomplish it. The individuals who don't feel they can accomplish it, they're not going to be able to. And specifically, he thought that these differences in self-efficacy influence three different aspects. One, he says it influences the magnitude of the task you're choosing. I don't know if you see the icon. What is that icon? Do you see the image? What is it? Weights. It's weights, all right? So you're at your local YMCA, you're going to your strength course, and they go, take some weights. And magnitude deals with, are you taking the two pound weights, the five pound weights, or are you going for it and doing the eight or the 10 pound weights, all right? So, you know, it's like, with your self-efficacy, are you going easy, medium, or hard? Right. So those who have self-efficacy go, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to go do something that's hard. Do any of you have any examples of that? In terms of magnitude, can you give me an example of, you know, uh, of either, well, I don't have a lot of self-efficacy for this particular thing, so I go easy. Or, no, I challenged myself recently because I believe I'm really skilled at this, and so you picked a harder test. Any examples? Yes. I'm going to think of in the day-to-day -day life, we have things we don't want to deal with. Correct. And we just put them off, and we just don't feel up to it. Mm-hmm. We don't do it. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, um, I'm reading a, a really charming book, The Library of Lost and Found. And the, the main character 
has lived in this home for a long time and there's a lot of stuff in the home. You know, she needs to clean out the house. And so she has very poor self-efficacy at the beginning of this story. Um, and so it's overwhelming. She can't, she, the, even the idea of cleaning off her dining room table is too much. But the story is, you know, getting to the point where she's developing self-efficacy and she's cleaning out the entire house. All right, so going from easy to, to hard. Another one is generality. Right. Um, there is a, I have a favorite Geico commercial, um, probably should be advertising Geico, uh, and it is, a, uh, I can tell that they filmed it in Venice Beach. I'm from California originally and my undergraduate degree is from UCLA, master's from Cal State Sacramento, and then my doctorate is from SUNY Albany. But in, they, they seem to have filmed this in Venice Beach and there's this group of individuals watching uh, an artist um, juggling chainsaws. I don't know if you've seen this. So they're juggling chainsaws and this, this husband and wife are watching it and the husband's like, give it to me. Come on. I can do it. You know, and he is feeling like I can rule the world because he bought Geico insurance. <laughs> um, and what generality is, is do you have enough self-efficacy where, well, are you, is your self-efficacy only for one particular setting or one particular task? Or do you feel enough self-efficacy that you're willing to try other things out of the box? Right? So, so um, you know, I don't know. If you have a self-efficacy for cooking, great. But is it enough of a self-efficacy that you're now willing to go to an art class? totally something different or go skiing downhill, all right? So it's that going into a new setting, generalizing it. Then the last is, and this is me, this is my weakness, is strength. Self-efficacy, uh, if you do not have a, a high amount of self-efficacy, you actually try a task, right? But as soon as you fail, that one time, what do you do? Quit. Quit. Can't do this. I'm done, all right? If you have self-efficacy, you keep trying it. You keep, I am going to do this. Like those stupid Rubik's cubes that I have never done in my life. You know, I have no self-efficacy for a Rubik's cube, but I really enjoy statistical analysis. And my students think I'm crazy. And I'd be like, the, the program's not working, the numbers aren't right. I will spend hours looking at the data and trying to find why is this program not working? Because I have self-efficacy there. So even though I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. I'm going to keep trying at it. Give me some examples. I'm talking way too much. Normally I don't talk this much. Yes. I learned that if somebody said it cannot be done, and I have give it 10 of examples as a chemist. Yes. And then there are 49 reasons as to why it would not work. Yes. Give me in writing. Yes. And I thank them because they tell me exactly how to make it work. Yes. So I like dumb. When somebody says it cannot be done, you start getting mad at that person, say, why not? Why so not? they give you the solution. Yeah. Because most yeah. of the problem, yeah. people do not know how, what the problem is. That's exactly it. You have to know the Exa problem, the solution is always there. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I have worked at Endicott College for 30 years. I never imagined I'd be that long. It, is, it was a two years women's college when I began. It's now with 500 students. We now have 2,500 undergraduates, another 2,500 graduate master's doctorates. And I stayed there because people in a lot of higher education can't be done. This is, this is the way you have to teach. This is the courses you have to have. And at Endicott College, it was just like, no. And it's like, let's play. So I invented majors, and I changed the way we teach, and it's wonderful. You know? But you have to have the mindset. You, know? you have to have that willingness. Like it's, if, you, if you say it's impossible and you go by that, you're going to fail. Another example of strength. Yes. Well, I was saying that um, something that probably hampers self-efficacy is that we have the mindset that if you're going to do something or try to do something, that you should be good at it. Hey. And I sort of <laughs> feel like, you know, at my age, if I want to learn to play the piano, I right. have no musical talent, I'm stone deaf, whatever, <laughs> I should do it anyway. Do it anyway. Okay. That's exactly right. 
so. Yeah. But how many people, and, and a lot of people will use the term self-esteem instead. You know, people will not try the piano while you have low self-esteem. And, and this is where Bandera said, no, no, it's not self-esteem. It's efficacy and the belief that you can do it. But he, he was, it's that old expression, it's never too old, uh, you can't, what is it, a dog can learn new tricks? You, know? can't you can't teach a dog new an tricks, old dog, an, old tra- an old dog new tricks. Well, yes you can, right? Um, you know, it's, it is, we, we're, we're doing great, you know, There's, they're showing, the, I just gave a lecture to my students on, on getting older. You know, it's like, well, what happens when you get older? And they're labeling all these things that get worse. And I show them the research that our hypothetical thinking, our math abilities, our communication skills, our problem solving skills all increase until our mid 70s. And then, yes, yes, we have some memory issues that happen. Uh, Yes, maybe we're a little slower in solving the problems. But if you have somebody in a plane and there's an issue, you want an old pilot, not a young pilot, because they're better at solving those problems. Um, And part of it is with age, comes hopefully confidence but what why I study this is, is I'm very passionate I I know I am very close I have relatives who their self efficacy is very poor you know they had they had very hard difficult lives and they became learned helpless mm-hmm. and so these individuals in my life some of my passion for this is to help them and it's like Come on. Uh, Sullivan with the learned helpless dogs, he, he retrained them. And he would try to get them out of the cage by putting like a juicy morsel and the dogs wouldn't come out. And what they found was the only way to retrain the dogs is they literally had to lift the dogs up and carry them over several times. And this is true sometimes. You know, and it doesn't have to be older individuals, but when people are learned helpless, you actually have to, you know, you're going to have to, like, you will do this. Show them the way. way. And so that's, this is where my passion comes from, is like from my my relatives. Um, But now I want to show other people that, and show me the way, you know, it's like. How about working in prisons? Ah. This would be really interesting, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen research on whether they're doing positive psychology in prisons, but that would be phenomenal. Right. Um, it would be really wonderful. I'm going to have to look that up. Thank what, you. What was the question? I didn't understand. Um, she's like, wouldn't it be interesting to offer positive psychology training within prison systems? Um, so that, because a lot of individuals who are in prison systems, they've probably been in and out. You know, there's been the recidivism Solitary. of it and solitary and and it's like it's breaking them and then suddenly great your sentence is over good luck um and if there is some positive psychology training where a belief system plus we need a whole bunch of other resources to support them maybe there we would reduce the recidivism rate all right that's fascinating um how do we gain self-efficacy so this sounds wonderful how do we do this well, the first one, Bandura called it mastery experiences. And this is the Nike logo. What's the Nike logo? You just do, just it. do it. Just do it. You know, okay, I'm going to fail, but I am going to do it. And that is found to be the most robust. You know, and you have to forgive yourself if you fail. You know, if it takes time, but you've just got to do it. Does anybody, has anybody just done it? Is, is there something that, like, you know what? I just did it. Any examples? Yes, ma'am. So I recently got hired. Well, I worked for a little company, and our company got bought by a big company. And so I got integrated to the big company, and um, it demanded a lot stronger computer skills. Ah. The young people. It was yes. A Palo Alto company, lots of young oh. Yeah, Stanford. Yeah, yeah. And I was very intimidated. Yes. And, you know, the minute they started asking me to do things, I'm like, my mind froze. Like, how can I do it? But mm-hmm. then as I started to be able to do it, do it. It's like transformed me. Right. It's right. My self-confidence. Right. You didn't, you just like, you know what? I'm just going to learn these new advanced computer. You learn it. And I yep. keep telling myself, of course I can do it. You know, I keep talking to myself. Ah, ah. That's I'm not, like burying a hole. That's the third one. 
You talk to yourself, verbal persuasion, all right? So you talk to yourself or you have people. Please tell me, please encourage me, you know? Get that reward, that verbal reward. Another, the middle one is vicarious experience, and that means role modeling. You watch somebody else do it, you know? And I, a lot of my students are totally into, and I am into, they're into the baking shows, the British baking show. I'm obsessed with the British baking show. I, I was like, I will do that. I don't know, I, you know, it's just somehow I'm gonna learn all these pastries and all these kind of things. Um, they all, the, my students are into makeup and uh, the female students, and they, <laughs> most of them. I actually, I shouldn't say that, it's very sexist. Um, uh, I actually have, a, one of my favorite alums is a, 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 an individual who identifies as male, and he's huge in the Sephora company now, and he loves the makeup. Um, but by, they wa watch YouTube. You know, and so they'll watch the little YouTube clips or on Instagram, there's these little, you know, 30 second, you know, you're making something in a microwave. And so you watch something and it's like, I can do that. The last one is an emotional state. And this is getting yourself ramped up. Right? Um, uh, the uh, rugby, Maui rugby team, you know, they have these chants, you know, and, you know, the before a game and they're getting themselves ramped up. That improves your self-efficacy. Yeah, yeah, showtime, let's go. You'll see that, you know, at, um, just watch a really interesting documentary on downhill skiers. And you'll see the skiers like jumping right before, they're getting their bodies moving, they're talking to themselves. That's all the, vicar the, the um, emotional state. And so a lot of his research in self-efficacy has actually been really adopted in the field of sports. Right? So there's a lot of sports psychology, a lot of coaches, and they're, they're training their uh, athletes on this all over the place. So what about positive psychology? I'm, now I'm going to introduce some, uh, some actual exercises for you. There's a book somewhere. I've got it. It's, it's a pink handbook. Uh, it's in the back of the room, but the picture, this is a wonderful workbook if you, if you want something in paper as opposed to the internet. They break down the various areas of how, of, of how to practice positive psychology, and then there's actual exercises, and you can actually write in the book. So I do recommend this, and if you're interested in the science of, of positive psychology, this is called The How of Happiness. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to find it. Uh, again, it has some really lovely exercises. Uh, it's more in depth, uh, a lot more detail than you might be interested in, but I do recommend it, and it's what I base my uh, four week se sessions on. But this is the website that I highly recommend, and I'm going to just minimize this and actually go on to the website to show you. Um, the Greater Good in Action website, this has been created by UC Berkeley, and who is massive in the field of positive psychology. And uh, you can sign up, it's all free. And they have amazing exercises that you can practice in the field of positive psych. And the, I don't know if you can read this, but the exercises are in different areas. So you can practice awe, uh, compassion, connection with other people, empathy, forgiveness, gratitude, happiness, kindness, mindfulness, optimism, resilience to stress, and self-compassion. These are all dynamics of positive psychology that they encourage you to practice. So I'm just going to uh, put on the kindness uh, tab. And what you'll see is if you scroll down, they will give you a number of different exercises. And they're coded by the green are easy, they don't take too much time, the orange are moderate, they take a little bit more work, and then they have a darker color, which you're talking one hour. And they'll find, they have found that if you practice these exercises on a regular basis, your emotional and physical health 
significantly improves. So I highly recommend these. You're going to find uh, information on the exercise. And I've, I've got a handout, uh, the second handout are actually downloads of these exercises. And so you will see that I have one of practicing happiness, there's practicing gratitude, there's about six of them, my favorite ones. And they will, they first give you the instructions on how to actually do it. Um, uh, if you don't have it, maybe you can share with somebody because I did run out and I apologize for that. But they also give you the science behind it. And that's why I really uh, respect this site. Um, there's a lot of information out there where it's the, the science is not there. Right? But this is saying we've run a study with smokers and we taught them kindness. And by teaching them kindness, they began to feel more like they could quit smoking. They gave more money and donations and they felt less depressed and less anxious. So there's the science behind it uh, with each of these exercises. So we're gonna do one more exercise and then you know, leave it for questions. So take your blue books out again. This is something that they recommend that if you do this for a week, you're gonna feel less depressed you're going to feel like you can get out there and go tackle the world. And it's called Building Happiness. And it's basically every day you want to list three good things that happened to you today. Right? And it doesn't have to be huge, momentous, you know, my IRS refund came. Uh, <laughs> It could, it could be, oh wow, there's a Starbucks on the way to Carlisle. I can stop and get a drink, yay! Or that cup of coffee was really good. Or, I, or ice cream, that's exactly it. So you list these three things, but that's not the key of the exercise. The, three, the key of the exercise is list the three things and then say why did they happen or how did they happen okay so give that give that a try can i ask some comments you absolutely can okay yes sir i learned from my mom that there is a problem there's always an opportunity and what does it mean and she said here's the kind you have a tail and a head so if you see tail be happy because head is underneath mm. And she also gave an example. When somebody dies, uh, people are crying, they're very happy. But funeral home is very happy because they have a client. Yes. So the question is, whenever there's a problem, so I'm always happy when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Because this is what I see, mm -hmm. what my mother told me. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing bad. So everything is good. You just mm -hmm. have to look at different things. I wish I had your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 the same. <laughs> Hi, I'd probably be more beautiful. I'll tell, you, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, because I had my heart operation, I had uh. five RT change, uh. and I did it on my birthday. And my doctor said, what would you do? I said, well, this is good, because now I'm making problems and opportunity for my family, right. because I have to sign a paper that I right. may die on that day. Right. I said, if I die, they don't have to remember my two days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did exactly on my birthday. Yeah. So yeah. I created a problem as an opportunity for them. And I, I so admire that. Um, but I know that there are people in the audience here where the same individual with the same health issues, rather than having that optimistic, uh, I'm going on to another journey, this, all this is exciting, are fearful, scared, feeling the loss, this is terrible, um, and, and which is totally normal. Right? Uh, but the research shows that if you can force yourself to have more of this positive outlook, you're, perhaps the, the, the recovery from your surgery is going to go a little bit better. No, I have diabetes, I have just about everything. Yeah. But when I give, kiss somebody, I said, I'm sweet. <laughs> so I said, I'm glad I have diabetes because I make, you know, give a kiss, I make somebody sweet. There you go. So you look at it different ways. So every day I live like that. So I love it. the problem, I never worry. I say, oh, now God has given me yeah. an opportunity. 
I love it. I wish everybody could be that way. You know, and that's that's why I'm doing this to try to help other people try. And it, and, and and again, there's people in my personal life where I've been working for years, and because of their life circumstances, um, it's it's I haven't been fully successful. I've been a little successful. Life's a little bit better, uh, but it's it's difficult. Yes. I have that situation in a family. My sister-in-law is so negative, I don't like to be around her. Yeah. But yeah. there are times where you have to be around her. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, re it's really... Um, it, you can feel your whole body. Yes. yes. And, and that's where you make your decisions of, of how and when and how much long, how the time for doing it. Uh, and where that's a, that expression, life's short, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, but it's, 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 yeah, you know, this is where you make your choices of, of this is not working for me. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so what, are the, what are some happy things that happened to you today? Anybody willing to share? Yes. I went out for a walk at 7.30. Ah. <laughs> and you're actually combining uh, one of the awe exercises is called an awe walk. Uh, and it's actually challenging because, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you like to go out for a walk. Yeah. Um, and I'm willing to bet that sometimes when you're walking, instead of going out for a walk and noticing the uh, forsythia starting to bud, you're actually in your own head. And you're, you're thinking of a conversation or a person or, you know, you're, and all of a sudden you wake up in a sense. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, I'm, I'm almost done with my walk. But you haven't released yourself, you know. Um, you haven't found the flowers uh, there. You totally missed the flowers. You didn't even know the flowers were there. Right. So that awe, I saw baby lambs today on my drive. Now normally when you're driving, you're driving like an automaton, you know. But I'm, I'm practicing, I taught this yesterday for senior citizens. Uh, and today it's like, practice Bev, come on, positive psych. So I'm looking around and past the farm and there were like 20 different new baby lambs. I'm like, oh! You know? uh, and my dog noticed them too. It's like outstanding. We need to stop here. Um, you know, but and we, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, and, and this is where I am passionate about my dog. But you know, dogs know how to. You know, dogs are there. They're in the present. They're appreciating things. You can tell they're not obsessed. They're, you know, and we we need to learn a little bit more from our dogs. I saw a hand. Yes. Uh, speaking of dogs, yeah, I was playing with our uh, new puppy in the house. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, and that was happiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very. Good. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think that I'm, I'm running out of time. No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. Oh, you, were you going to? Yeah. So I went to Ocean State Job Life just to buy. <laughs> what was I buying? Some kind of peat moss or something? Yeah. And it, I spent eighty five dollars because I found all kinds of cool gardening stuff. That I Don't get me started with job lots. <laughs> when my partner's like, "We're going to go to job lots," oh no! So, but it is fun. It's like, you know, they, but there's all sorts of things you did not realize you needed. So, yeah, but it, it's happy. Broken. Oh, yeah, I mean, and and then this is actually a good time. Like, it is it is springtime. And so a lot of us are starting to feel happy because of the forsythi and the garden centers are opening and the ice cream store. But this is actually one of the more dangerous times mental health wise for individuals because a lot of individuals are feeling happier and then you suddenly realize you're not, right? that you are depressed. And this can be very uh, difficult. Uh, and this is where there's actually a spike in suicides in the spring uh, because there's that bigger contrast. Everybody's miserable in the wintertime, right? yeah. um, you know, especially here, all right? But, you know, not me. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> we all need to go to his house. 
<laughs> we do. We need his mother. Uh, um, yeah, so it. So be aware of that. You know. Uh, and again, it's another reason to practice positive psychology. It looks like I have about five minutes. Um, do you have any questions for me? Any comments? Discussion? Yes, sir. Would you say President Truman, uh, Truman. is a positive thinker? <laughs> no, I would not say that President Trump is a positive thinker. I mean, I, and, and I think it, it would be interesting to, to, to look at the research. They've actually done research on Facebook to, to steer it away from politics, which can be really um, uh, upsetting. Um, they, they've done um, Facebook who's been in the news a lot, but they did uh, some really interesting research and they changed their um, programming so that the negative programming went to your bottom of your feed and the positive programming would appear on the top of your feed. And they, they didn't do any informed consent on this. They didn't tell Facebook users this at all. So ethically, there's compromise. Um, but what they did is they then looked at the kind of postings that people did. And they found that the, when people were seeing the more positive postings, what happened? They were more positive postings. And so that's my answer to President Trump is that um, I, I don't, I haven't done an analysis, but my understanding is he has more of a negative sentiment in his postings than a positive sentiment. And hate crimes, oh. have, increased. And hate crimes have increased. And so there, there is likely a, 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 a link there, yeah. Yes? Uh, do you have any tips on how to deal with negative people? Nah. Uh, because I find them draining. <laughs> on, um, uh, you could do, I mean, it, it could, you could do some of these exercises. You could, you could, like, divert a conversation. You know, it's like, you know what? Tell me something that good happened today. Just steer the conversation away from the negativity. And then sometimes you have to just be concrete and say, I choose not to have a conversation about this. This is upsetting to me. Um, how about we talk about this? Or why don't we go take a walk? Um, so I would try to divert the conversation or to be honest. No, honesty is a good thing sometimes. Can you define negativity? Negative. Mathematically, mm. because I know what matters. But when negativity to me is subjective, because what is negative is mm. always a positive. Well, the question is, somebody curses you something, mm. so then you learn the new words. You know, you bring up a, a really interesting point, which I was speaking with, I think it was Dana, um, uh, before this talk happened, objective versus subjective. Yeah. Um, and really, positive psychology is all of it's about subjectivity. All of it is about changing your frame of mind. Right? And so even if you have a negative, um, there's this really interesting exercise. I gave it to you. It's a, it's a hard exercise. It's an exercise of forgiveness. And the exercise is asking you to think of an individual who you have sore feelings, that you, 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 something happened, and for you to practice forgiveness. All right? Not to say it was fine what you did to me, not to let them off, but to let it go and to say, I forgive you. And that's a subjective. It's like rather than taking that negativity and that weight that you're carrying to choose to take it off of you. Uh, and it's all subjective. You know, the, it, the, what, the way, you know, even perception. You know, I, I often get into my head like, well, I know that's pink, but how do you see that as pink versus the way I see that as pink? You know, the brain is, is all, we're all different. And, you know, it's, it's very hard to have a fact, you know, except for the temperature Kelvin, which is the true zero um, of temperature, even Celsius and all of this zero doesn't really exist. There's still temperature there. Um, it's all subjective. What is cold? What is hot? Subjective. Yeah. Um, yes? On self-efficacy, yes. you want to challenge yourself yeah. so that it's not too easy, but if you challenge yourself enough so that it's you're getting the self-efficacy, then you're going to fail so many times. 
if it's hard for you, you're going to fail, and that. So where's how do you? The the choice, and that's where um, self-efficacy coaches. Um, they'll design it um, so that you have modest but achievable goals. Right. So, uh, and, and, and if you're doing it for yourself, how do you tell? I, I, well, you are, well, you're the best person. It, and it's, it's okay to fail, but if you find you're failing over and over again, and, and I will, I mean, I'll, be, I'll just say like 10 pound weights, which I can't do. And it's just like, all right. I'm, I'm not going to label it's like, oh, poor me. Like, no, every other woman in here is doing an eight pound weight. I'm not going to then start feeling bad about myself and embarrassed about myself. That's where I find a lot of individuals want not go to a group exercise class uh, because it's like, well, I can't do what everybody else is doing. I'm failing. And it's just like, no, I'm going to set a modest goal for me and, and I'm going to try it. And if I keep failing, that means don't. Don't feel bad about me. I just need to go down a little bit. Right? And you don't put that label, the label on you. You know, it's like, uh, it, you, it's like I'm a failure. I can't do it. Instead, I can do it. You know, I am powerful. You know, it is that you have to be positive. And believe me, um, you know, I'm not perfect on this. Uh, <laughs> I have um, the bank that I belong to. They have. You had to write like a little phrase to prove that you were on the correct website um, for fraud. And the phrase I have for me is what my partner tells me all the time. Honey, stop being so negative. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. that, that comes from my upbringing. I had a tough upbringing. I came to psychology for reasons. Right. And so I've grasped that that weakness of me, and now I try, but I'm constantly, constantly, you know, it won't work out, this is not going to happen, and he's the opposite, heart attack, great, I'm still alive, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and yeah, got to gotta watch, yes. I was waiting to see whether I had enough strength to ask this question, but on the way <laughs> over here, earlier this morning, it suddenly occurred to me, from out of the blue, that I am automatically information. Oh, wow. Am I on my way to enlightenment? <laughs> <laughs> I am not able to answer that question, but I hope so. I hope so. One last question. I have discovered, and it may be true for other people or not, that you have a choice in grieving. Yeah. A, a choice in grieving. Um, and what a powerful topic. We could spend hours on, on grief. But yes, um, and this is where I respect different religions and different philosophies about death. Um, you know, there, there are some religions and different ethnicities and cultures where it is a celebration, whereas in, in more of our American culture, a loss, um, depression. And also, we don't, um, it, with grief, um, uh, we're too quick to label grief as depression and, in, in the United States, and we're too quick to label like, all right, get over it. You know, this individual's been dead for three months. You know, come on, get up, get, you're, you're, you're okay. Uh, and they start to label you as clinically depressed. And there's, yes, you know, um, all about the label, uh, allowing the process of grief and what, how you grieve, you know. It's okay to smile, to laugh, to enjoy, even though you're still grieving. Um, yes, that's okay. That assuming one, there's one type of grief, oh. assumes there's one type of death. That's exactly right. And there's a myriad of reasons and things that happen. The death yes. of a child is very uh. different than the death of a 99-year-old person who Correct. goes to sleep gently in the, you know, Correct. in the evening. Correct. They're very, very, very yep. different things. One we celebrate, yep. one we cry over. Yes. And, but we want, we want to train people. You know, like, like, you are not grieving correctly. All right. You are not approaching your life correctly. You know, positive psychology is like you need to empower yourself the way that is going to help you. Right. With that said, thank you very much. I am honored. Um,